Museum of Russian Impressionism Original Tour – The Traits of Russian Impressionism Hello, my name is Yulia Petrova and I'm the director of the Museum of Russian Impressionism. Our museum was established not long ago, only in 2016, on the basis of the private collection of the businessman Boris Mentz. The term Russian Impressionism was coined a lot earlier. It appeared long before our museum. Sadly, however, the definition of this term isn't quite fixed, yet meaning that the phenomenon of Russian Impressionism isn't widely acknowledged. Here I will try to explain what you should be looking at when you visit an Impressionist exhibition, whether it demonstrates works of French artists, or Russian, or Scandinavian, or German, or even American. Here we have a small early work by Konstantin Korovin, perhaps one of the most famous Russian artists at the turn of the 20th century. He made it in the 1880s and called it Inner Park. It was probably painted in the Sokolniki Park. Korovin later recalled his years as a student when he and his friends walked to parks and forests of Moscow and painted the views with a few paints they could afford. It was a fun time for them, and Korovin recalled it with great love. I often hear people believe that Russian artists imitated the French. This is far from truth. Konstantin Korovin was a student at the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture and Architecture. He worked at Vasily Polenov's workshop as his apprentice. And Polenov once asked him, are you an impressionist, young man? And Korovin could not answer, since he had never been to Paris and hadn't seen Impressionist paintings. So the style he found was the result of his own search, because Impressionism is a natural continuation of Western painting. After the dry and precise academic manner comes the time when young artists seek new expressions of color and light. Konstantin Korovin, Valentin Sirov and their groupmates were the artists at the origins of Russian Impressionism. At the Museum of Russian Impressionism, we demonstrate not just works of famous top-tier artists like Korovin, Serov, and, for example, Igor Grabar. We present artists who are less known among wide audience, but nevertheless deserve praise and attention. Please take a look now. Stanislav Zhukovsky, The Autumn Forest, 1911. Whenever I tell my visitors that in this work the artist lay the blue colors of the sky over the green and brown brush strokes of foliage, it seems illogical first, because we know that in a landscape, sky serves as the background. However, for an Impressionist like Zhukovsky himself, at a certain period of time, it doesn't matter at all. Impressionists work not with objects before or behind other objects. They work with combinations of colors, with brush strokes, that create a wonderful mosaic and form the final picture in the viewer's mind. Let's look at Nikolai Claude's works. Baron Nikolai Claude was the descendant of a famous aristocratic dynasty. You might know him by the sculpture group of the Anichkov Bridge. In St. Petersburg, Nikolai worked mostly for theatres. He often complained that Korovin and Golovin wouldn't let him really shine. All posters mentioned only Korovin, and Claude was disappointed that he was never allowed to create a poster for a show just on his own. But he couldn't leave theatre. From autumn to spring, he worked enthusiastically in Moscow and St. Petersburg. 
In summer, he left the city to draw studies. In these three months of work, he made paintings that in autumn would be presented at exhibitions of the Peredvizhniki. Konstantin Kurovin recalled how Claude, in moments of sadness, asked him, why do they call us this ugly word, Impressionists? Kurovin told him not to worry, because they said the same of French artists, and they have great works. And here we are today, in the Museum of Impressionism. Let's go from colors to composition. Konstantin Yuan, Gates of the Rostov Kremlin. If the artist's goal was to depict the gates of the fortress accurately, he probably would have taken a different, farther perspective, opted for the canvas of a different size, left more space around the walls, wouldn't have cut the towers. But in reality, the artist, as an impressionist, was far from mere documenting. The gates are nothing but a theme that he chose for this work, while in fact his true goal was to master colors. Look, he hardly used white pigment for the walls. Instead, we see light blue, dark blue, pinkish, green, yellow and lilac shades. Since there is no pure white or pure black in the nature, Impressionists pay close attention to combinations of nuances. What happens to Impressionism next? What colors does it take in the 20th century? During the 1900s, a true revolution occurs in the Russian art. The artists we know now as the Russian avant-garde come to the fore. Perhaps this is the most world-known work of Russian art. We are standing next to the work of Vladimir baranov Rosine. He's mostly famous as an outstanding avant-garde artist, who tried many art methods and techniques, who even invented some new trends, who suggested new steps in art. Our museum demonstrates Baranov's early Impressionist painting. It's important for us, because works like this one are a proof that avant-garde painters tried their hand and trained their eye with Impressionist paintings. Petrov Vodkin used to say that Impressionism was like a primer book for artists. Two years ago, our museum hosted the exhibition Impressionism in Avant-Garde. There we gathered early Impressionist works of such famous masters of avant-garde as Kazimir Malevich, Aristarch Lentulov, Mikhail Larionov, Natalia Goncharova, and many, many others. And it became apparent that indeed, in the 20th century, without Impressionism, the Russian art would not have evolved. On the third floor of our museum, we see works of the Soviet artists who emigrated from Russia in the 20th century. Nicholas Tarkov left for France long before the revolution. His departure was in no way political. He believed that in Paris people would really appreciate his art, and more importantly, he would marry a French woman. There she is in the painting. She is depicted with their two older sons. While creating this family scene from his own life, the artist, as if lets the viewer peek into his private world, Alexander Benoit sarcastically called Tarkov's long brush strokes the Tarkov's noodles and added that one could recognize them at any exhibition immediately. And indeed, in Paris, Tarkov found success. He received commissions, he even signed a contract with a famous art dealer. The artist even had his own exhibition. However, he thought he was underpaid and the contract was cancelled. Who knows, maybe today Tarkov's name would be as famous as Van Gogh and other artists under the care of French marshals. So, what about Soviet art? People often tell me that Soviet art consists exclusively of socialist realism. And of course, it's not true even for artists who seemingly dedicated themselves to the party. For example, we are standing next to the paintings of Dmitry Nalbandyan, who was nicknamed the first brush of the political bureau. He painted every leader up to Yeltsin. Still, almost all artists found time to paint for themselves. 
Create works like this one, made from 100 fleeting brush strokes, like the portrait of Demetrius, long in our collection, or Autumn Morning by the Bonfire. Dmitry Nabaldan used to say, I make a landscape with three strokes, one for land, one for sky, and one for my signature. It was a joke, of course, but there is a grain of truth in it. Just look how boldly he pressed his brush against the cardboard at the imprints he left. How different it is from Dmitry's paintings that many Russian people know from Soviet textbooks and catalogues. The history of the Russian Impressionism ended around in the 1950s. Sure, professional artists today can reproduce these separate brushstrokes, these lines, this work with color and light that made Russian Impressionists famous. Still, their works won't become revelations. So, modern art requires new interpretations of the new reality that we live in.